Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my guests from Canada. Welcome, Robert Clank. Good to see you again, Arnie. Pleased always to a pleasure to talk. It is. It's always good. It's always good. What's the weather like over there? Oh, it's been rainy today, but that means that the snow is uh, going away. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's still quite a bit of snow left here. We had a fairly heavy snow cover this year, but mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're getting out of it now. And the forecast ahead is for uh, temperatures above zero. So Okay. I, I yeah. had a, um, I watched a video the other day about Valdez in um, Alaska. And oh. uh, in the video, they showed snow on the side of the road. And I think it was about uh, 20 feet high, 20 foot of <laughs> yes. 20 feet high. And I don't believe that it was just the snow thrown off the road. I believe that that was no. the real, this is what it is. It's 20 feet of snow. So um, it's a different world, you know, in, in Australia, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different world. Wallace Clink, welcome. Hi, Ernie, I'm back and still intact. <laughs> Beautiful to see oh, you, Wally. A bit of a health crisis, but anyway, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it is a different world, Ernie, from one place to another. We, I've seen, you know, back in the 40s, I think, we had such deep snow that you couldn't even see the trains. They had to cut their way through the snow, ba snow banks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really, really something that a person in Australia just wouldn't, wouldn't really conceive of. No, that's right. <laughs> but that's what it is here. And, uh, but anyway, things are fairly, fairly decent. It's a little bit chilly the last couple of days, maybe a bit below zero, but I think it's scheduled to uh, move above the zero point again so i'm assuming that we're moving further and further away from the frigid frigid canadian winter okay well we're we're actually we're in autumn and the weather has cooled down um noticeably we're in the low 20s instead of the high 20s or early 30s um and i i will make a note that, that uh, daylight saving our summertime will conclude next weekend um, it's interesting because there has been some discussion about um, not bringing in daylight uh, summertime anymore, which is uh, just another another point of view of why did we do it in the first place? I think it's to actually get people to um, to move, to move around, to get used to changing things. Once you're on the road to changing, then then of course you're um, you're available to um, to do as you're told. And that's actually going to bring us up to our first website because um, I want to bring it up and I want to actually place a discussion on the table. The Thinking Housewife, um, thinkinghousewife.com, saving us from mummy and daddy and C19, um, understanding the thinking that goes on with the coronavirus and how the government is there to save you. And, and it's quite, um, it's a very interesting website. Um, I've been there and, I, and I'm quite impressed with the calibre of um, articles and the discussions that take place. You don't have to agree with their point of view, and I'm not advocating their point of view, but the discussions are most interesting. Now, um, ALOR, our library, I just wanted to touch on that, that it is a resource of hundreds of PDFs and other documents, including the, uh, the archives, the social credit archives, um, at the New Times, archives, the Fig Tree archives, the On Target Australia archives, literally 10,000 documents just in those group of, um, of, of, of archives there, but um, several hundred PDF books. And in particular, I wanted to touch on some that I think are relevant to today. First one by Senator Joe McCarthy, Treason in Washington. Um, this is his speech of where he actually presents the case of who was doing what and how, uh, how immersed our, if you like, our governments have been in the, in the communist conspiracy. How immersed, and you say, oh, that's not so, that's not so. Well, there's another bloke called John Stormer, and he wrote, none dare call it treason. And um, he made a point of this, of going through and documenting what was actually going on in his time. And of course, the I think the first one that did come out, Gary Allen, none dare call it conspiracy. These are, these are documents that go back as many as, say, 40 or 50 years ago, and they were presenting a case, presenting their case. In this case, it says over 5 million in print, none dare call it conspiracy. I'm sure that those numbers are, are uh, superseded many times over. Um, but I think it is important. Now, in Australia at the moment, 
as of this morning, I believe there were 14 deaths. 14, one four. And in Canada, it appears that up till now, there has been 65 deaths from that are attributed to the coronavirus. 65 deaths. I don't know if that is pre, unprecedented in the history of uh, influences that go through every year. I don't know. I'm not going to argue that point. What I'm going to point out is that the the policies that are coming out of our governments, the policies, the separation policies, the fact that we um, have shut down our whole industry, um, really, and, and the fact that we can't discuss things, we can't go into public meetings, our parliaments have shut down. These are vital things that we are losing our freedom second by second. We are losing more and more freedoms, virtually on a weekly announcement by our governments. And I think that the um, that this situation is is completely out of hand. It is completely out of hand because of the erosion of our freedoms. We are being Bolshevized. The Soviets are in charge of our governments, and they're certainly in charge of the media. Your thoughts, Robert Clink. Well, it's interesting to uh, contemplate how such a situation could come about, but in fact, we know that. Uh, extreme communist movements have been given support by financial institutions from their very inception. And uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's hardly a surprise that our, our governments seem to be following this agenda of uh, promoting centralization and communization. Right now, we're going through a, an exercise in conditioning the population to obey. That's, that seems to me to be the primary purpose of, uh, of all the uh, regulations and stringencies that are being applied to people having to practice social distancing and not being able to leave their homes even. You know, this is... Uh, this is a revolution. It's a it's a tremendous transformation of society, and uh, I was out today shopping, and I, I was reminded of what I'd read of Moscow or the the Soviet Union back in the say the 1950s when people were lining up under control and they they couldn't move freely, and uh, this is this is the situation we've been uh, brought into, and it's we know that. Uh, going back decades, even centuries, I think even back to after the Napoleonic era, there was advocacy of uh, internationalization of the world affairs. And uh, we seem to be arriving at a culmination of this. It's a strange process because it seems to be taking a long time, but it's progressed step by step. And now we're at a position where it seems to be being fulfilled uh it's, it's uh, such a, such a change it's, it's it's hard to comprehend except as the uh outcome of some kind of plot or conspiracy yeah yeah now i appreciate your your candidness robert because um that's why i presented those book those books there by people who've made, who've taken the time and the trouble to actually investigate the permeation of uh, of acts of treason and that's the title the final treason um that's the title for today's forum your thoughts wally clink well the thing of it is it's a matter of philosophy again are men are men and women meant to be controlled by certain powerful um, groups within the within the society or are they meant to have a maximum of freedom of thought initiative creativity and action in life what is life? Is life suppression or is life release? And you cannot have release if you're increasingly dominated by regulations and controls. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems to be an anti, an anti life philosophy to assume that, that there apparently is no natural law that, man, that the more supremely intelligent amongst us are entitled by some. 
uh, some uh, decree that uh, they're they're entitled to control us, to dominate our lives. Mm. And I think that that is a very, very gross misconception. I think it's a very dangerous misconception. And I think it is literally destructive of the very nature of life itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as the virus is concerned, I would not be willing to deny the existence of the virus. But the thing, that is, the thing that is frightening is the degree to which individual people are so easily conscripted into a common pat prescribed pattern of behavior, which actually is having very many other damaging effects uh, on people's security, their psychology, their mental health, their, mm -hmm. their physical health, their, uh, their financial viability, their the security of the material uh, holdings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would su suggest that it would be highly desirable for at some point a thorough examination be, or study be conducted in order to determine just how real assets, real assets of value transfer hands in possession as a consequences, as a consequences of the extreme pressures that are put up, being put upon uh, businesses and so on, which are, which are just against the wall. They're they're increased even today. I heard that there are more and more suggestions by more by more and more businesses. They they, they just won't be able to hang on. They're going to have to let go. And you know, all all assets are mortgaged these days. We don't have freely held wealth. There's a mortgage on our future. And if you cannot secure a continuing source of income, you cannot uh, guarantee the security of your, your absolutely essential uh, needs. Uh, it's, it's, it's really quite frightening. I think it, whatever, whatever the situation is with regard to the actual virus and the health regarding the virus, I have a suspicion, and that's a very strong suspicion, that there are people waiting in the sidelines to take advantage of it. In other words, never let a good a good uh, situation or crisis pass mm. without without utilizing it or making taking advantage of it. That is a uh, it's a materialistic concept. It is uh, a selfish concept, and it's a blind concept. I mean, I don't understand. It's it's really this phenomenon of human beings simply running according to suggestion that is planted in their minds out of fear. You remember the War of the Worlds? Yeah. People were jumping. People were committing suicide. Mm -hmm. There was no there was no Martian invasion. It was strictly a, a radio presentation. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with reality, yeah. and yet people were actually the fear that resides in their minds. Now, the fear that resides in people's minds is largely due to the knowledge from experience that they are not secure under the existing financial system because they are all put in a position of mortgaging their future. And if they have a break or a hesitation in their income flow, they can lose everything they've got. And that, of course, has been a successive thing with the financial system. We've had busts and booms and surges and recessions and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. where there is always a big transfer of wealth because those who hold the mortgages foreclose on those who are no longer able to service, service them. Mm -hmm. So right. I think that, yeah. I think that we're, we were, we're facing a situation where we are being, regardless of any other considerations, I think we are facing a situation where we're being defrauded. Yeah. Yeah, no, valid point, Wally. And, and and the thing is to compound the situation in Australia, our parliament has decided to shut down for the next five months. And the fact is that the very thing they should be doing is being open and so that all politicians are present. And if they can't be present, then resign and get someone who can and be present in parliament so that these things can be discussed every day. We don't need new laws, but we do need the forum of discussion. And that should be televised so that any false reporting, any any sort of hyper hyping up a situation, showing um, army trucks in convoy and saying these army trucks are full of 
full of um, body bags when they're nothing of the sort, and then showing coffins, coffins, a, a room full of coffins from a shipwreck that happened several years before, but they're showing Still. this as images depicting what is going on, and it's a fraudulent method. Now, the fact that Parliament is not there and it's not actually discussing this fraud, it means that the communities are being subject to the propaganda wing of the New World Order. Don't think it's not. Mainstream media is owned by money. It's owned by the money power. And so they are pursuing this, um, if you like, this this acts of essentially, what would you call it? Media terrorism, I think would be an, an adequate description. They are terrifying people. And in this fear, like War of the Worlds, this same inordinate fear, they are doing anything and everything they're told. And they're not thinking it through. I've got, I've got outlaws very close to me, and they're walking away from businesses. They're being, they're they're hanging up their 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 shoestrings. They just they this is all too hard. And they're going to the government, as it said in that uh, the Thinking Housewife. They're going to the government, cap in hand. You're my mum. You're my dad. We need help from you. The only one who can help me. Instead of the very thing, the very justification for government is that it provides the individual with the opportunity to find their own expression, their own independence, their own self-reliance. It's all gone. We're being Sovietized in front of our eyes. And the, the main weapon they're using is propaganda. Your thoughts, Robert? Well, that's exactly right. <clears throat> the media should be a, cri cr a critic of the government. But the days when that was the case seem to be long past now. And as far as I can see from the media that I'm listening to, and I, I try to avoid it as much as I can because it almost makes me sick, but uh, the media is just an agency for the line being uh, uh, proposed by government. And the government is getting this from some deeper source, probably uh, international organizations like the World Health Organization, which has a a very checkered and unreliable past. Mm -hmm. uh, so 24 seven, we're getting these horror stories transmitted to us through the media and they are failing utterly in their responsibility to examine what the government is saying and see if it is, it is verifiable. Mm -hmm. They don't verify anymore. They're just getting uh, press releases and repeating them in the in the media that uh, they're involved with so it's a a, a a betrayal of the population by the media it's it's a very uh, sort of soviet situation we're in now and we almost i guess we do have a kind of samizdat uh, 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 an underground medium uh, communication mm. but that that is necessary because we're not getting uh, proper information from the uh, the commercial media mm. and you know you would wonder how is it that all of a sudden these governments are coming up with vast sums of money in order to bail people out or to allegedly get them through this crisis you know, it was a scandal in Canada that we had a $26 billion deficit in this year's budget. Well, the government had just said, oh, well, no problem. We got uh, this crisis developing, but we'll just uh, uh, distribute $115 billion, mm -hmm. more than four times as much, uh, in order to uh, tide people over through this. Now, it's, I don't think it's going to tide them over in a way that won't leave them more indebted than they, they, they were before the crisis began. But uh, isn't it a normal thing to ask, wh where does this money come from all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. It's like what happened in the world wars when we went from depression and incapacity to achieve anything economically and all of a sudden we were able to multiply productive capacity over practically, uh, you know, many times over. And suddenly money was available without limit in order to prosecute this uh, destructive activity rather than constructive activity. So people should be asking <clears throat> where money comes from and we know where it is. 
It's manufactured, it's created out of nothing, merely by the entry of figures in uh, computer systems. Yeah, yeah. It's nothing more than that, and we're all slaves to it. Yeah. You know, if you've got a pocket full of bills, and bills are a small part of the money supply, practically all of it is financial credit, doesn't have a representation in paper form at all. If you've got some money in your pocket, you feel like a free man. If you have none, you're a slave. Yeah. So how have we got into the situation where some institution has a monopoly on the ability of us to be free or slaves? So it's dreadful. Yeah, no, that's very well put, Robert. I'm just going to take one step back and then I'm going to pick up where, you, where you've just left off. The step back is to our website here, and it's actually a book by Malcolm Muggeridge. It's called The Great Liberal Death Wish. And in that, um, in that's a very, very important book because Malcolm Muggeridge talks about his, um, his being in Russia and his actually being part of the, um, the media and how they would fabricate stories out of thin air. And there would be food cues and they would, and they would uh, explain them away as being something benevolent when in actual fact it was a complete concoction by that uh, particular journalist. And he was as guilty as any. Um, but what it did was it opened up his way of thinking. Now, thinking of, well, what is the truth of the situation and are, are we based on truth or a lie? Now, I want to put something on the table here and I think it's very important. And that is the, you talked about the depression and uh, and the fact is that um, Germany, this this last century, Germany, Germany has gone through some horrific um, problems with its economy, and it was absolutely destitute. And uh, and Hitler was voted into power. And what happened was there was a new release of credit, and by institutions from America and England, the Bank of England was responsible for a twenty million pound loan to Hitler Germany. Don't think they weren't. So these institutions loaned Hitler's administration money. And what happened was that he used that money to actually build on or build from the real credit of the nation. The real credit was the people's ability to actually produce. And so the light was turned on in Hitler's Germany. And, it, and they produced and they started producing and they just continued, continued. The issue that Hitler had was he was turning it into a war machine. Had he turned it towards the people and been of, of a calibre of person that would actually build the infrastructure, build the homes, build the farms, build the, the very nation building assets instead of war machine, then Germany would be in a completely different place. And he was selected more than elected. He was selected no different than what we're seeing in Britain when we had Theresa May selected by the media mogul Murdoch, selected, not elected. And then, of course, Boris Johnson, and it gets to a point where people in their political parties won't move. We had the same phenomena in Australia when, uh, when Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister, a highly unpopular and Murdoch arrives, and what happens? We've got a change of prime ministership. And no doubt, I wasn't around at the time, but the earlier Labor prime ministers, who were, it was like a rotating chair, and there were so many changes. And the fact is the media, the inordinate power of the media. But coming back to Robert's question, of which he touched on, was very, very important, is this ability to create credit out of nothing and then to harness the real credit in the community, the ability of people working together to produce the things they desire. Your thoughts, Wally Klink. Yes, the financial system is an abstract system which has been captured and is uh, mobilized to serve the interests of those who seek power and wealth. Of course, it's the concentration of wealth. And uh, But money, people do not seem to realize money is something they think that they can carry around and if they are carrying it they think it's in the bank it's money is simply accountancy we write up uh, accounts as we uh, as we create costs in the act of production and we cancel money in the process of consumption when we buy the goods and the money is recovered and then the bank 
the uh, business repays its its production loan. And um, you see, it's quite proper that uh, money be issued as a credit for production, but we have to ensure that there is sufficient income on the consumer side to, in the process of buying the ultimate goods, to actually cancel the full amount of costs that were created in that program of production within the same cycle. And that's where things go wrong because we have a system that prematurely cancels money and it's not available when it's paid out as income to buy the goods of which it is a cost. And so then you're driven to go to the banks who will create more money in the form of credit, which is debt. Banks don't give away money. They only lend credit, which they create. And so that the system is not synchronized. It's not balanced. You're generating incomes at an increasingly smaller rate of flow than you are actually producing costs, financial costs attached to the goods and services being produced. And so therefore you have to do something and you run off to the banks. They're the only people who have a monopoly on the creation of credit and credit is money. Douglas was taught, Major Douglas, who originated social credit, worked for uh, uh, British Westinghouse in India, and the comptroller apparently uh, engaged him in some fairly lengthy and somewhat abstruse discussions, but he explained that the whole thing was dependent upon credit. And this put the seed in Douglas's mind when he later on realized that we do run on a credit and that it is essential that the system be designed or that it should function in a realistic manner. So uh, anyway, that, um, and then later on when he was working for on the uh, London Post Office, Office Tube, he, uh, he was a bit mystified because they were working along and everything had to be going fine. And all of a sudden they get an order saying they had to stop because there was no money. Well, if money is just accountancy, which simply records what you do and what you consume, then there is no limitation on money. There is no limitation on money because you're just reflecting in a numerical way what you're doing. And so uh, people don't understand that and, and that's what blinds them to the reality of the present financial system. They seem to think that there's some kind of a finite supply of money out there and oh, if you, the government mustn't, mustn't tax because uh, they'll run out of money, <laughs> which you can't do. I mean, it's an abstraction. It's just accountancy. But it is used in a way where that issue of credit and cancellation of credit is varied in a way which causes great booms and then causes recessions where those who control the issue of that credit are able to foreclose on the real assets of the nation, which are mortgaged. So it's, it's a scam. It is just an incredible scam. Mm. I guess maybe it's such a scam that people can't even get to the point where they can imagine such a scam. Yeah, It's just too much to even comprehend. And it's a tragedy. It's the tragedy of humanity. It's a responsibility for wars, recessions, for inflation, for, oh, it's just it, all of virtually, we have all the resources we need to have a wonderful life, but because it's all controlled by credit, which is issued in a, in a, in an artificially restricted manner. And sometimes to get the whole population mobilized and then to crack down on them by pulling the rug out from under them by contracting the credit, which is necessary to cancel old costs mm -hmm. and through prices. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's unbelievable. It really is. It's something that is somehow or another beyond the... Uh, it's, it's scary the way people are easily subject to abstractionism. Yeah. And they can be panicked, frightened, persuaded into doing the most irrational things for no reason that is embedded in reality, whatever. Yeah. It's a pure illusion. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a um, very well painted picture there, Wally, and I really appreciate you um, bringing it to fore. 
Um, I'm going to hand it over to Robert because I've lost my thought. Yours, Robert. <laughs> well, why do you assume I have a thought? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was going to say that uh, uh, this, the, the way this money system is set up, it actually assumes that people have no value in themselves, that they have no interest in this money system. It is run totally apart from them and their ability to influence it. And it means that they are all subject to its arbitrary dictates. And this is why we have a population that is so subservient. And this is why we can't relate to each other in an honest way, because we don't have the financial independence, the financial uh, security just inherent in our existence that allows us to be free and to say what we think and communicate and uh, follow our own interests. And this is accepted somehow. It's, it's, it's astonishing yeah. because the potential of, of everything around us is so great and yet we cannot access it unless we get permission from these financial centers. Yeah. Yeah, now it's, I've, it's, I've got my thought back, Robert, and I want to I want okay. to build I build on what you said, and that is that the um, here it is our governments are actually issuing hundreds of millions, if not hundreds of billions of of units of money, whatever currency you've got, and most of that is going directly back to these same banking houses to alleviate debt. It's going straight back. It doesn't actually, and what it means is that, of course, the level of indebtedness of the government, and they don't mind indebting the government, the level of indebtedness goes up further and further and further. And so you see these debt for equity swaps where they hand over parklands or ports or infrastructure or whatever and in order to, um, in order to uh, cancel some of the debt. And so in the end, the financial system owns the whole world. The fraud continues on until they own the whole world. Now, taking a step back, as I, I used the illustration of, of uh, Germany, early Germany, 1930s, and how that policy of re-industrialization could have been for the good, but it wasn't. It was for the destructive. And that man was chosen just for that. But had it been for the good, had it turned around and you say, well, let's actually have a an issue of new money debt free. What about new money debt free? This this current money that's coming out is not debt free. The government will be further indebted. So the banks are quite happy to for them to issue hundreds of billions of dollars. And all it means is that in the end, more and more of the natural wealth of the whole world goes into the coffers of these central banks through the fraud. That's that's what you're looking at. The homeowner is a good illustration. They'll never get to own a home that might have been built 20, 30, 40 years ago. They'll never actually get to own it. And yet they've worked their whole life paying it off. It really is so, so insidious. 33 minute mark. Wally Clink, closing thoughts and comments. Well, physically, it probably doesn't require more than two or three months to build a home. And in that period, the physical costs have to be provided. If they're not provided, you wouldn't get the home, would you? Mm -hmm. That's the materials, the, the human energy, and so on that goes into making the home, including the goods that go into making the home, not just the construction of the home itself. Mm -hmm. In other words, building a home is no big deal. Mm -hmm. But it's a big deal for you and I and every other consumer who has to take on a mortgage for 25, 30, 40, or 50 years Mm -hmm. in order to acquire the use of a home, which you don't own because the bank owns it, basically, because they have a lien on it. Mm -hmm. Now, it shows you the degree to which humanity is, is grossly enslaved. We are having to work for those half-century years continuously with our sweat, with our effort. We have to extend, expend our energy and our materials over that period to acquit the mortgage. Mm. When the physical costs were already acquitted when the house was finished being built. 
it, it gives you a, an idea of the enormity of the fraud that is being perpetrated upon humanity. Mm -hmm. There was an author some time ago who wrote a book called The Babylonian Woe. Mm -hmm. He traces the history of money going way back to the earliest times. Money has been misused, misrepresented, used as an instrument of oppression and deception all through history, but it becomes much more so today because with our modernization of industry, we are creating costs in excess of labor costs, which are, which are greater, greater and greater, more in excess. And that leaves a gap between available income for purchasing and the actual costs of goods which are created. And so you have a situation that therefore that it's just uh, getting worse all the time and not only worse but drastically worse because this gap between incomes and prices gets greater and greater because incomes earned are the only source of free income that you have mm -hmm. and they're because they're shrinking all the time relative to the total cost of goods yeah so uh, and we are just simply being enslaved more and more on this treadmill of uh, frenetic activity in order to service this fraudulent financial debt, which purports to be a reflection of reality and is not. But Thank you, you know, there yeah. seem to be no people in places of high power who are interested in releasing humanity by giving them a, a realistic understanding of this process. Yeah, We're all obedient to this system because we're dependent upon it for our very lives and security, yeah. and including our families and everybody who depends upon us. Mm -hmm. And so we, as a matter of fact, it's a strange phenomenon, but I get the impression that people are frequently afraid to discuss it because somehow in their minds, they have a subconscious awareness that there is some dreadful power there that they daren't challenge. Mm -hmm. Better to just su submit and try to survive in the system yeah, yeah. it's mad madness absolute yeah. madness yeah it is we've um, we've gone over the cliff i'm just going to cut across to our website and um assel david assel the babylonian way there it is there so um if you're of a mind to have a look at it and uh, read what they've got to say um then there's the book 197 pages and um and yeah it's in our website it's in our library you can download it and read it i've got to be honest i haven't read it but um there's certainly a lot of other books that i have read your uh, closing comments and thoughts please robert well <clears throat> wally said that you don't find people in positions of uh, authority or great influence who are willing to discuss this issue and promote the uh, freeing of the individual to the financial system. The reason for that is very simple. If they started doing that, they would not for very long be in positions of influence because you're not allowed to talk about those things. We live in a society of absolute censorship where it comes, where the matter of finance comes into play. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to find people advocating using the power of finance to liberate individuals. Mm -hmm. And you said, Arnie, that we should have debt-free money, and that is a fact. But we also have to establish the relationship of individuals to this financial system. And whether, by virtue of the fact that you are a member of society, you have an interest in the ownership mm -hmm. of the financial system. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason why we don't accept that it is a monopoly it has been a monopoly for now centuries and those people are not interested in uh, having the general population become shareholders in that monopoly so that they are increasingly independent and uh, not controlled by uh, uh, the credits that are being issued on condition by this uh, financial monopoly yeah. So that's that's the position. And we got to get down to some fundamentals here and start talking about the uh, natural rights that people should have in having access to the proceeds of, of the monetary system. Yeah.
Yeah, the natural rights, not only the proceeds of the monetary system, but also the outworking of the economic system so that prices can be liquidated. And right. and that in, its, in itself, Douglas spoke about, was referred to as economic democracy. Economic democracy, the national dividend, not a dole, a dividend. It's yours and it belongs to you. And it's not conditional th issue through the government. It's yours. It's an inherent right. You are receiving your cultural inheritance in the form of the national dividend. And if, as we're seeing today, this, uh, if referred to as helicopter money coming out on the community, what it's doing immediately is it's causing an escalation in prices, especially food and the basics. And th that's inflationary. Now, the Douglas proposal also has a response to that, and that's the consumer price discount. It, it poses, it holds prices stable. It won't let them. It's, it's, it was used in the war years to hold a basic stable, and there's no reason why it couldn't be reintroduced and continue. So the prices are stable. The dollar still buys you what the dollar did last week, last month, last year. It still buys that. That's what the consumer price discount is all about. So these, this situation has been thought through. The independence is reflected in economic democracy. And uh, there is probably another facet as well, and that is the um, responsible vote. And you can do a search on our, uh, on our website on that. It's not for today's forum, but um, today's forum has been most informative, and I really appreciate a uh, contribution from both you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Arnie. It's been very nice being with you. It is a challenge. It's an amazing challenge. It's also discouraging in a way that people are so blind to the problems that, uh, that afflict them. But we have to keep on and shed some light on the world. That's it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Wally. Okay.